regarding Ninja Tree, uh, the, the film went from uh, oddity to cult classic. What were your thoughts about the movie uh, when you were making it? And what are your thoughts now? Because it's it's a strange movie. <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird movie in many senses. When Revenge of the Ninja came out and was a success among the audience and, and money-wise, financially, so the company wanted immediately to make a sequel. <laughs> they already had two. Let's make number three. So uh, the head of the company was uh, Menachem Golan. He was a director. He was the producer, head of the company. For, he called me in and he said, okay, Sam, let's make another movie sequel. And for some reason, which I don't know until today, I never asked him, he didn't want Shokasugi to be the, the, the main hero of this movie, of the next movie. Uh, and and he, uh, maybe they had some problem. I, I don't know why. I don't know why. And uh, he, he, he turned to me, he said to me, why don't we make it a woman, a movie with a woman? Okay, it's okay with me. It's, uh, it's his movie. He's, he's uh, paying me money to direct the movie. <laughs> it's his product, in a way. But also it was a good challenge. I said, okay, a woman is fine. And, and the movie moved away, straight away from martial art movie to other areas that you mentioned. And I'll tell you why it moved away from this, uh, uh, this area. When there was a script, uh, uh, we took the same writer, Jim Steele, and I worked with him and we wrote a script for a woman. But from the beginning, Shokasugi was still involved in making the movie. He was, uh, he was part, he was still working for company. But the only thing that Menachem Golan didn't want him to be the main character of the script, of the story. And he didn't like the idea, of course, that he's not the main character. But he felt that he did very well with the Revenge of the Ninja, and he did. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And when he heard this idea that a woman will be a ninja, the ninja, he, he didn't like it. He was actually very much against it. Uh, he was against it also in the level that she is the, the hero of the movie. And he said, a woman cannot carry a ninja movie. A woman cannot be a ninja. She doesn't have the physical power and, and the audience will not accept her, which he was right, by the way. And, and, and uh, he was against it very much, and he was objecting. And I was sitting with the writer, with Jim Steele, and said, how do we resolve the problem? What, what can we do that uh, Shokasugi will agree and we will come along and everything will be okay? And then we came up with the idea of the possession. The woman, uh, which eventually was uh, Lucinda Dickey, she is not really a ninja. And, and you know, by the way, there were in the mythology, in the Japanese mythology, there are women ninjas. There are. Uh, they are usually in groups. The, the little that I know about it, I don't know. Uh, and they appear as really evil women, the group of ninjas, and they do all kinds of things. So there are women ninjas in the mythology, in the Japanese mythology. And even in some Hong Kong movies, you will see a ninja woman. But... Uh, but not a, as a main hero in a movie, no. Uh, so we came up with this idea. We said, she's not really a ninja. She's not trained. She's possessed. There is a bad ninja. Shokasugi is going to be the good ninja. There is a bad ninja. And he dies right away in the beginning of the movie. And his spirit goes into, eh, into her. And now we enter the, the world of the movie, The Exorcist. She's possessed by ninja. She's not a ninja. And, and everything she's doing is with the power of the dead ninja. So Shokasugi, who is the good ninja, eventually is really fighting the bad ninja within the body of a woman. So this was good. This was okay. In his mind, Shokasugi mind, everybody mind, they agree. Now we already are moving away from traditional martial art movie. And because we were there already, so we needed an excuse. How come she has all this skill? Let's make her a dancer, a, a instructor of uh, aerobic dancing. So now we are going into the, the world of the movie Flesh Dance. So now we have Flesh Dance and we have uh, Exorcist. And there are a lot, at the time also, the movie Poltergeist came out. Toby Hooper directed. I love this movie. I, I, so it was influenced very much by Poltergeist. So you elements of Poltergeist into it. And then how this has became a, such a hybrid movie of different genres together, 
and we are working in the script and sometimes when you work on the script you don't feel that what you are doing you don't you don't understand the mixture the cooking that you are doing because we didn't have time it's not a studio that we we write a script six months seven months we finish everything in two weeks two three weeks the script is ready <laughs> let's go let's make it so you don't have time to analyze what you've done <laughs> what you've done and and we went and we shot this movie at the time for me as a director as, a, as somebody who has to solve so many problems in action movie we, we don't have the time like in a regular drama to rehearse to think to take our time to, to reflect on the script we are working all the time in the filming 12 hours then i have to go and see, and see the daily see the material from yesterday another two hours then then sit in the office talk about tomorrow another one hour usually it's 16 hour day for the director we are busy busy and the challenge is fantastic i have to to, to work with all kind of things with position with flying sword with the exorcism with the with the the room is moving with the sucking in you know, this poltergeist sucking everything into the cabinet uh, fight sequences uh, there are optical effects uh, there are one optic good optical effect at the end of the movie I'm very busy and I'm consumed by the excitement of making the movie. There are so many different challenges. The opening sequence, which people talk about until today, it's a, it's a crazy opening sequence with the helicopters, with cars flying motorcycles into the water. So we didn't know what we were doing. We, I saw it, you see it, when the movie starts to take shape in the editing room. And we look at this movie and I, I told myself, what a crazy movie, you know, like, what did we do here? Are we crazy? We took a liberty with an, even with, within the ninja world, we took the, the mysticism and the magic farther, you know, that the ninja is disappearing in the earth in yeah. the beginning and at the end of the movie. So we took even the magic of the ninja one step farther in there. And, yeah. and the movie went to the theater. Indeed, it was not success like it was not successful like uh, Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3: The Domination. Well, at the time, and you know, again, I, I it's hard to analyze, but I, I believe that Choka Sugi was right. A woman ninja was not as popular with the, with the kids like a man ninja, and the mixture of maybe maybe this mixture of many genres of movies didn't appeal to the action uh, audience. So the movie played, was not a big success like uh, Revenge of the Ninja, and it played and it was forgotten. So, so we are now 1984, the movie plays, 84, right? And it uh, disappeared in the, through the 90s. Comes the new millennium, the 2000, and I start to hear more and more about people now watching more and talking more about Revenge of the uh, Ninja 3, the domination. There is internet. There is a Facebook, a Twitter. I start to see growing interest. People did not forget this movie. But not only this, there is enthusiasm. There are bigger, bigger modules. Suddenly I was invited to, not long ago, I was, in, uh, I was invited to a fantasy film festival that this was the major, major movie screening in the fantasy film festival in, in uh, Slovenia. Uh, there were screenings without me, you know, uh, I was uh, contacted by uh, clubs, screening clubs, and they, you know, through internet, I, I will do an in, uh, introduction to the movie. And they're screening more and more Revenge of the Ninja. And, 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 and I'm sorry, Ninja 3 The Domination. And it reached a, a, a level of cult movie. Now the people, the young people, there is a new generation that look at this movie and say, who could have made this crazy movie? We love this. It's a ridiculous, crazy movie. There is a club here in Los Angeles that they screen a uh, real movie, 35 millimeter, not uh, not video screening. It's a club, the people enthusiastic, and they had a screening of Revenge of Ninja 3, The Domination. They called me if I would come and say a few words in the beginning, answer question. The, the, the theater was full, hundreds of people. And they came with costumes, with ninja costumes enthusiastic crowd came in and the movie was screening and they know the lines they see the movie they saw the movie so many times so they already know the lines they, they talk with the screen and they, they scream the lines and they know what's coming and what moment and it was an exciting screening unbelievable 
But of course, they don't take it seriously. They take it on a level of cult movie, ridiculous cult movie, not a, not as a serious movie, not, a, not as a James Bond. Of those kind of phenomena that we cannot predict. <laughs> it's uh... there is nobody surprised more than me. I'll tell you. For us, we made when we made those movies, Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja Three: The Domination. In our mind, it was a small, low-budget movies that. We'll, we'll play in theater, video six months, one year, and then they will disappear. We didn't take it seriously. Obviously, we didn't take it And we didn't have any expectation. We didn't believe those movies uh, will survive. The first time that we had this feeling was when we made American Ninja. That this movie is a little bit more than regular. But when we made those the, the Ninja movies, it was just, okay, let's have some fun. We'll make a little movie. Canon, the company will make some money, and that's it. The movie will be forgotten. Nobody will remember a small movie like Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3 Domination. So nobody's more surprised than I of this renewed enthusiasm and interest in, in, in this new movie. Uh, the first time uh, I was able to, to grab a copy of, of, of Ninja 3 on the internet, it was a, an old VHS rip that looked like uh, like something from uh, from another uh, planet and now you you see new editions so it's uh, it's clear that that the film will remain we were lucky in a sense i will tell you you know the canon company the canon company you know and i worked for another few years existed but then he went bankrupt and there were a lot of uh, creditors came the the bankrupt uh, procedure and the movies, and there were many, uh, Canon uh, produced about 400 movies, a lot, a lot, a lot of movies. I was lucky, or I was, the movies that I directed were lucky, all of them went to MGM. MGM took it from Canon, and they took care of it. So, so it's also important that if you have a company that really takes care of it and, and gets the DVD out and puts it on DVD, and uh, not, not long ago they put it on Blu-ray, and the same thing happened around the world. American Ninja uh, became a pop cultural landmark. What are the fondest memories that you have uh, of making those two films of uh, American Ninja? Well, American Ninja became very special, very special. The idea of American Ninja is Menachem Golan. Again, <laughs> he was crazy enough to suddenly say, forget about the Japanese, let's make American Ninja, which was a crazy idea because Ninja in Japanese, it goes together with the Asian, with the Asian, with the Far East. Suddenly, the Menachem Golan comes and says, let's make American. Ninja. Well, that's fine with me. I, 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 it's okay. It's also, I, I found it as a, it's a good idea, you know, good cinematic idea. And, uh, and so we, we wrote a script. So this time, I was really involved from the beginning. There were uh, producers. They they assigned us producers, Gideon Amir and Avi Kleinberger, myself and a writer, uh, Paul Demilke, not the same writer, not uh, not Jim Sen. Paul Demilke, who, who comes from uh, martial art and psychology. And, and we had time to work on the script, to develop a script from scratch, from zero. And, and, and we had this notion, we wanted to, to make you know, at some point we decided that he will be a soldier in American army because we wanted to make an American movie. We didn't want to make a movie about Philippines. And they told us we must go to the Philippines because there was some money, Canon. I don't know, they had money in the Philippines. I don't know why. So we have to go to the Philippines. And we didn't want to make, a, as I told you before, I, I really like to make American movies. So this was a gimmick to have a soldier in American base. We still have an American looking movie even if we're in another country. And we started to build the character. And from the beginning, for some reason, discussion between the writer, myself, the producer, we decided to do this uh, hero, which is a reluctant hero, somebody who doesn't want to get involved in the, in the action with the attitude of James Dean, type of an attitude, but a story like uh, uh, High Noon, with a hero who doesn't want to get involved, but at halfway through the story, is being sucked into the action. 
So we started to get emotionally attached to the character, I at least myself, to this character of American Ninja, because it was appealing, it was interesting, it was not just magic and poof and puffs, and he had a character. And then there was the casting process, which we saw 400 young people. And eventually, my preference was uh, Michael Dudikoff. I really, really liked him when he came in, and I, I, I saw him, with him, within him, I saw the character that we put on the script. It was, for me, this was the match. Eventually, Canon, you know, Menachem Golan agreed with me, and they made a deal, they hired him. Mike Stone was the martial art choreographer for this movie. Mike Stone is famous in the world of martial art. And, uh, and we started to film. I, I usually like to start filming action. Uh, and this way I impressed the company. It was my, one of my tricks. I start with an action scene, the company is happy, and then they, they don't bother me for the rest of the, of the shooting. And first of all, it was fun. It was a big crew. It was, there were many people, you know, uh, in the creative side, the wardrobe, the art department was excellent. The, the wardrobe people, uh, uh, she was fantastic in coming up with idea. We invented the military look of Ninja rather than black. Uh, uh, the art department built built for us an American military base over there. In the in the action department it was interesting. We, we had, as I said, Steve Lambert, and he had assistant Kenny Lasko. We had uh, uh, Mike Stone. Uh, with Tadashi Yamashida, the Black Ninja, <laughs> Black Star Ninja. Uh, Richard Norton came from Australia to be one of the people helping us. So there was a big group and it was excitement and it was working. And when we see the material on the screen, I started to realize that number one, Michael Dudikov has some special charisma on the screen. Something on the screen, some special charisma that it's something that you cannot, there is no recipe for this. You don't know, it works. And the relationship between him and Steve James, we had Steve James, the relationship between them are also special on the screen. They have some special chemistry, something really worked between them. We were lucky that also the relationship between Michael Dudikoff and Judy Aronson on the screen had a good chemistry, you know, two young, beautiful people, uh, all together, three young, beautiful people working, making a movie. The crew was very big. We had three units. There was. We could do whatever we wanted. There was no limitation to what we want. It's very cheap to shoot in the Philippines. And we had good, uh, we had some American crew, and but we had the Filipino crew, and they just finished finish the movie with the Coppola uh, in, in the Philippines, the Vietnam movie. And uh, so it was good crew. They knew what they were doing. The, the, the Filipino crew was good. And we were shooting in exotic locations, very interesting locations. Uh, so we got the feeling, so this was the, it was really exciting. It was really exciting time every day. And sometimes we work around the clock, the two units, you know, in the morning I work with the first unit. We had two filming units, we actually had three filming units. So in the morning I work with the, with the one unit and in the eve, and then when we finish 12 hours, I go and work with the other unit, with the other cameraman and his crew, and we shoot other other sequences. It was exciting and 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 really as and the editor was here in los angeles the editor that i worked all the ninja movies michael duffy was in los angeles editing the movie and then we start to see the scenes put together you know he he's editing the scenes together and we start to see wow it's really working the action is exciting and uh, steve james and michael Dudikov on the screen it works very well eight weeks of shooting or nine weeks i don't know seven days it was good it was nice of course the movie was bigger longer than what we see today a few scenes didn't make it to the screen so the music was good everything looks good and menachem golan approaches me when we are in the final stages of editing and he's, he comes with a script which was called night hunter at the time it ended up uh, avenging force and he's asking me can you read the script and tell me if it's good for uh, Michael Dudikoff and uh, Steve James? So I read the script and I was blown away. The script is fantastic. Better than any action script I ever read before. Avenging Force or Night Hunter. Okay. So next day I said, okay, yeah, it's good for Michael Dudikoff. So he said, okay, go and make it. By then the company was already very big by that point. And they already had in contract Charles Bronson and uh, Chuck Norris. 
I didn't know Chuck Norris rejected the script came to me because Chuck Norris didn't want to do it but at the time I didn't want didn't know so they say okay you guys go it, it was written for New Orleans you go and make it in New Orleans the company became so big that they didn't care anymore so the day we finished the editing of the uh, American Ninja music everything mixed and I moved to New and the movie did not come out you know they're still preparing distribution they have to prepare so we still didn't know we we knew that we liked the movie we we see the movie we like it it has good fun good love story uh nice actors everybody looks good so we went to new orleans and we started to shoot avenging force and then when we all of us and it's the same group myself as a director michael dudikov steve james <laughs> the two stars of american ninja and then the movie came out when we were working and then slowly slowly week number one week number two in the theaters we start to hear and to understand that this is an explosion this is not revenge of the ninja this is not ninja 3 this is an explosion and we start to understand you start to hear worldwide not only in america not only in north america in paris in france in paris the movie was for two weeks at the top of the box office <laughs> they called it american warrior not american ninja, in france and and so we start to understand this is not only we did a, 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 a interesting movie good movie again i'm talking about the low budget the world of low budget i'm not talking about big big studio movies we did something good here something which is uh, uh, taking off worldwide so it was exciting uh, the the minute we did avenging force and we came home uh, back to Los Angeles, it was done in New Orleans, and editing, and American Ninja was such a success that there was no question, they wanted American Ninja 2 right away, right now, today. <laughs> but I still, I was still busy with the editing a little bit and the music, but uh, even faster than before, the day we finished the editing, I was already on an airplane on my way to South Africa. And this was again exciting, exciting movie because it was a lot of fun. We already knew that when we did number two, we knew that we are dealing with a big uh, action uh, success. You know, we couldn't walk. The movie was done in New Orleans, in uh, South Africa, in Johannesburg. We couldn't walk in the streets anymore with Michael Dudikoff and Steve James. They were big. Everybody already recognized them because they saw American Ninja. <laughs> So we couldn't walk in the streets. It's good memories. I have good memories from those two movies. And, uh, uh, you know, myself, on a personal level, I think that Avenging Force is a better movie than American Cinema, talking about cinema, character, action sequences, it's better. But uh, I, uh, I'm not the judge. The audience is the judge. <laughs> the audience around the world, they like American Ninja. It's a big, big, until today, you know, it's classic. Uh, of all classics. American Ninja was was one of the, the most famous uh, movies uh, in in Portugal and uh, Michael Dudikoff was a big, big star. Uh, we, we were talking in the beginning of our conversation about uh, the, the rental stores. There was not a rental store in, in the country that didn't have the, the picture of Dudikoff in, in some of, uh, of the movies. But if you had to single out one of your movies as a, a, a favorite one, personally? I really think that Avenging Force is a, is a, it's, it's the most, from a directorial point of view, it's my best work. And script, script right? The script was written by James Wood, the British actor, James Wood. He wrote the script. The, uh, and, and you know, even this movie is slowly, when it came out, it was not popular. And it was not distributed by MGM. Uh, there was some, the, at that time was fight. There was a big fight between Canon and, and MGM. Lately, just lately now, which is again, 35 years later, you start to hear more and more people want to see this movie. More and more people are discovering it in the internet, in the streaming. There is another movie that I like a lot. It's called Riverbend uh, with Steve James. It's a movie about, uh, racial tension in the south in america in the in the 1960s the story so i like it a lot it's it's not a popular movie that people know about a lot riverbend but i like it because of the social uh, subject 
but so is avenging force. Many people are telling me that 35 years ago was predicted in the movie, was predicted what's happening now in America. The action is spectacular. And the, the ending sequence in the rain, in the, in the water, in the rain for 10, 12 minutes, non-stop rain and in, in the bios, in the swamps of New Orleans, of Louisiana, a magnificent piece of action. Do you have any plans to direct again? Are you retired? Uh, do you have any dream projects? I was always, in my career in Hollywood, I was a director like the classic Hollywood structure. I was director for hire. I see myself as a good storyteller in visual means. So if somebody has a story, a, a script, and he wants to translate it to the screen and make the, the word into visual, that's my expertise, that's my, my talent, my, what I know how to do. And for some reason, due, through my career, 30 years of making movies, I, I was kind of more and more pushed into this group of making medium budget movies, action, genre movies, action movies, uh, science fiction, I made one science fiction, etc. These kind of movies disappear. Today, nobody makes movies, no established company makes movies with medium budget. The movies today are either very big movies, very, very big movies, or very low budget, <laughs> extremely low budget. I never made the leap. I never moved to the big budget movies, to the studio in my career, my directorial career. So, and, and I directed 25 movies, which satisfied me as a director. And uh, uh, in the last 10, year, 10 years, I did not direct any movie in the last 10 years. And I'm now busy with the nostalgia, with the maintaining the legacy of the movies that I made. So I, I, I don't have any pet project that I, 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 I'm carrying with me and I want to, if I want to do something, if I want to do something, it's not a small independent movie. I really, it was always my dream to make a big budget movies. I want to make a movie with a one million, a hundred million dollar budget. And, and uh, because I already made the small movies, I don't have to prove anything in the small movies, the world of small movies. I mean. And I don't think anybody will hire me to make a $100 million movie, $200 million movie. I'm happy that there was a capsule of time in the Hollywood history, in the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s. And it's, uh, it's called the low-budget genre movies, uh, created by independent companies. And it's not, it's not there anymore, it's a part, it's, part of the history of Hollywood. And I'm truly, really happy that uh, young people and, and loyal older people, but even young people are bringing back today and paying attention to this type of movies that we, I was part of. I was not the only director. There were many other directors. Albert Payun, you know, this, this week passed away one of the directors, Steve Carver, who was part of this uh, of this group, Joe Zito, and, and uh, that we made this type of movies that had special tastes, special, something special to them that is not created anymore today, was not created before we did it. And I'm happy that we are preserving, and there are more and more books written now about this, this period of time, uh, of this type of movie, which is called the independent movies genre movies of the 80s and 90s based on uh, the home video market. And uh, I hope uh, people will preserve it and, and uh, keep watching it. And I'm thankful that uh, they're coming back.